Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. So this happened a year ago when my husband and I went to the cinema to watch a movie. Let's call him C for anonymity. And I don't really remember what the movie was, but the theater was half full. C and I loves to sit at the very top middle of the cinema to directly face the monitor and not be bothered by other people. So most of the time, it's just us in the entire row. When we got to our seat, there was another guy sitting at least four seats apart from us to our left, and then another couple by the aisle on the right. It's just the five of us in that entire row. The guy was wearing a hoodie, and it's up on his head, so you can't really see his face. He also has a big black backpack with him that he puts on the floor. That was already a red flag to me, because... It's a big theater, and they don't allow bringing big bags. But at that time, I noticed that in the entrance, there wasn't anyone to check bags. But I just tried ignoring the uncomfortable feeling that I had. The couple to our right moved to another aisle seat below us, so it left C and I with a guy in the entire top row. This is the description of our sitting arrangement, just so you have an idea. I'm sitting on the left side, and C is sitting on my right. The guy is sitting to my left, four seats apart. We are on the very top of the cinema, but there is a space at the back where you can stand. Everything was fine, until the guy started picking up his backpack and scrunching inside it like he's looking for something or going to get something out, and then he would stare at us. He would stare at us for at least a good two to three minutes, then start scrunching inside his bag again, and then stop, and then watch the movie. Even though I'm not looking directly at him, I can see him in my peripheral vision. He would continue to stare at us through the entire movie. And C has noticed it too. The guy just wouldn't sit still. He would start turning towards us, to let us know that he is looking at us. Then at that time, he would get up and just stand there on the aisle and then stare at us. We both are not confrontational, so we tried our best to ignore him. Also because we didn't want to bother anyone and it's only the three of us in that row. So if he did something to us, we might not be able to ask for help. I asked C if we can move to another seat because I was feeling very uncomfortable. Maybe another row. But he didn't want to because, one, we love sitting in the middle seat and all the middle seats including the one below us are already taken. We both didn't want to sit on the side of the theater and we don't like being too close to the monitor. And number two, because he didn't want to get the guy's attention and make him think that we were scared of him. So, we both tried our best to ignore him, and also because we both are not judgmental person, we wanted to give the benefit of the doubt that he was just weird and just want some attention. But he keeps on staring at us and keeps on scrunching in his backpack again, like he is purposely doing it to let us know that he has something inside his backpack. Well, my imagination starts to get wild and I started thinking that he might have a gun inside his bag and then start shooting. But then, the most uncomfortable thing happened. The movie was close to the ending, like 20 to 25 minutes to the ending, when he suddenly got up again, took his backpack, but this time, he went to the back of our row. Although we could not see him, we knew that he was standing close to us. C and I felt very uncomfortable and we were so sure that he would start doing something bad. He just stood there until the movie ends and we both can hear him moving, not knowing what he was doing. C and I both tried to calm down and hope that nothing will happen. Finally, 
The movie ended, and we immediately got up and left. We didn't bother to see what he looks like, we just wanted to leave, and we were so grateful that nothing bad happened. The entire situation was odd and it really creeped both of us out. I have no idea what his deal was, and why he would stare at us, and why he stood up at our back. But the next time that this happens again, screw it, we're moving to another row. This happened about a year ago at the most popular mall in my area. I went there with my husband and I decided that I wanted to go to the stores but not inside of the actual mall itself. Like you have the main area and then the buildings on the side that are basically whole stores in the strip. My husband decided to use a massage chair so I told him that I was going to go to another store outside of the building. I honestly didn't see any harm in it because I usually keep knives on me for protection, so they make me feel somewhat safe. And as soon as I'm able to walk to the first store in the strip, a white van pulls up slowly in front of me. I was about 15 to 20 feet away from the curb, and the first thing that I notice is that there are two men wearing black ski mask in it. One of the guy cat calls me and makes a comment about my butt while I'm standing there. And by this point, I am paralyzed with fear because I've never experienced this before. After the dude says something to me, they immediately start driving off and disappeared before I could take a picture or anything for evidence. So I'm still in shock because of that and I ask the nearest couple what they heard and if that really happened because again, I was in utter shock and panic at this point. After I asked the couple, I immediately speed walked back into the mall, got my husband, and then spoke to a cop that was inside, as if that actually did anything in that moment. But after I spoke to the cop and described the van, he made like an announcement, and then my husband and I left the mall. One of the main reasons I was so freaked out is because of the fact that the target next door was clapped for child trafficking and I didn't want to stick around for something else to happen. And a store on the opposite side of town also had a child-related incident. So this area is kind of sketch when it comes to certain stores. I may not be a child, but it still worries me because you know people can be unpredictable. I used to work for a local donut shop that was staffed by, for the most part, three people. Myself, the owner's son, and then one other guy that I pretty much never saw because he only worked on days that I was off. The store was open at 5am and we either closed when we ran out of donuts or we would close at 1pm. Whichever came first. We typically ran out around 9 or 10 at the latest. So, really that was when we closed. It was a decent gig, it paid well, and while the short hours meant that I never really had a full check, I did get free donuts and didn't have to work a full day. Honestly, I was in my early 20s, so this was an ideal job for me because I didn't want to work full hours and I love donuts. Enough about the shop though, that's not the important stuff. What's important in this story is the employees. As I mentioned, it was myself most days, and when I was off, Jeff would take the same shift. However, the owner's son, Hunter, worked every single day, all seven days of the week he worked. The thing about Hunter was that he was obviously just there to get a paycheck, and he didn't care about the business at all, even though it was literally owned by his parents. Every now and then, when his mom or dad came into the store, he would actually do work, or at least pretend to. But the minute that they left, he would be back to doing a whole lot of nothing. So needless to say, he was getting paid more than me for more hours a week, 
and his idea of working was sweeping the back office for five minutes and then sitting in the office chair for four hours on the computer. The worst part about this was that Hunter was also a pervy creep. While he was on the computer in the back, he would quite frequently watch adult-oriented content. At first, he would try to be sneaky about it. He kept it muted, would click off of it quickly if I had to go to the back, but it was pretty obvious what he was doing. But after a couple months of this though, he started getting more bold with it. He would leave it on while I was in the back and he knew that I was cleaning or prepping there and I could see it. Then, after a while, he started playing it with the volume on and as expected, it started on low but he quickly started playing it louder and louder until it was on full volume. It got to the point where the customers could hear it and that was where I drew the line. I was working the front and a lady came in with her two kids, neither of which could have been older than eight, and she was asking me about the specifics of some of the donuts. I was explaining which filling we had, and out of nowhere, the very obvious ambient sounds of two people enjoying each other's company came playing from the back. She looked back with her eyes wide, her two kids looked back laughing and asking what that was, and I could tell that I was beat red. I apologized profusely, and I gave her the donuts for free, and I apologized a second time. The whole time I'm trying to get this transaction done, the noise is just playing in the back, as if he didn't know it was happening, or as if he didn't know that it was loud. And as soon as the lady left, I grabbed the phone and I called his mother to tell her what he was doing. And much to my surprise, she didn't really seem to care. Her solution was that I should go to the back and tell him to turn it down or ignore it. I told her that the customers could hear it and that the last lady had kids that were subjected to the common adult content profanities and sound. She laughed. She actually laughed when I said this and said that she would have a talk with him. But until then, I needed to do my job and ignore it. I was honestly shocked. The owners had always been decent people and had never been hit with the level of apathy from them. But it was also the first time that I had to report an issue with her son. After I hung up, I decided that I would do what she said to go tell him to turn it down. And I walked to the back and knocked on the door at first, just in case. But when he didn't respond, I took a deep breath and braced for whatever that I was going to see on the other side of that door. If I told you that I wish I hadn't done that, it would be an understatement of the century. I won't go into full detail because it's honestly just disgusting, but I have to explain a good amount of what was going on to highlight how messed up it was. I will say it was creepy and disgusting, but I also know that some people will find humor in the whole thing, and that's okay because I did laugh after the fact. When I opened the door, the first thing I saw was Hunter sitting in the chair and dressed as the day he was born, and I had expected that he would possibly have his pants down, but I didn't expect him to be completely naked. After I noticed that he was naked, I noticed something else, and again, I won't put it into fully detailed words but I will say that he was enjoying a donut. If you can put two and two together, he attempted to turn and cover himself and yelled at me to get out, but it honestly was like a train wreck. I think that's the best way to explain him though. Hunter was a train wreck. I think you'd have to be to sing so low as to pleasure a donut at work with customers and a co-worker in the other room. I immediately shut the door, I took off my apron, tossed it on the counter, and then left. I was not dealing with him or with that situation anymore. I got to my car, I grabbed my phone, and I called his mom again. She asked me what I needed, and I told her that her son was in the back office, naked, and then explained to her in very great detail what he was doing to the donut. I could tell by the fact that she didn't know what to say, 
and that she no longer thought it was funny. I wrapped the call up by telling her that I quit and that it was officially her problem and not mine. After I hung up, as when I literally burst out laughing, it was gross. It was really, really messed up. But also, how low do you have to sink to do that to a donut? Anyways, that's my story about when I worked at the donut shop. I will say that I never went back, and I asked them to mail me my last check, because I did not want to look at Hunter and have that image come back to my head. They closed the shop a couple of years later, mostly because they had a lot of bad press when Hunter sexually harassed several customers, which tells me that his mom, having a talk with him, literally did nothing, and that he was just a natural-born creep. I'm pretty sure that he caught a charge at one point, hopefully. Anyways, I hope you found some humor in this truly disgusting tale, and I hope that Hunter and I never ever meet again. One late night at around 3 a.m., I was sitting at my home on my PC, just watching movies and playing games and etc. When I noticed that I was out of cigarettes, the only thing that works late at night is our local gas station, not too far from my home, but still, it's easier to go with car. I took my car keys, and I locked my house and I went to a gas station. I live in a small European country, which is the most safe country on the planet. Still, that doesn't mean that some bad things don't happen here and there. When you exit from a suburban area where I live, you need to take a right so you can take the main road. After that, you just go straight for about half a kilometer and then go left for another half kilometer just to get to the gas station. On halfway, I noticed some girl on the sidewalk walking faster than usual. It looked like she panicked and I noticed two guys behind her who were like 10 feet away, maybe less. They were pointing at her and doing some hand gestures towards her. They gave me a really creepy vibe, and as I was getting close to the girl, I noticed that she had a scary face on, like she was about to cry, but didn't cry. So I pulled over close to her and I said very quietly, Hey, are you in trouble? And she just looked at me and noted with her head nodding. So I told her to get into the car, and she did. I told her that I'm going to the gas station to get some cigarettes, but I will take her home as soon as I finish buying. She thanked me for like a hundred times, and I asked if she wanted to go report it to the police, but she said only to take her home. So I went to the gas station. I bought me my cigarettes and a bottle of water for her. She was clearly in fear, and then I took her home after that. We passed the same street where those two guys followed her, but those guys are never to be seen. Just imagine what would have happened if I didn't run out of cigarettes that night. So this happened last winter. Fog starts setting in my city at the time of sunset, and it gets really dark really soon. Now, my university has a policy of not interfering in anything that happens outside, even if it's right outside the gate in front of the guards. A few days before my stare down, there was some talk going around about a student's phone getting snatched right outside of university. So, one day, me and my boyfriend were sitting in the car outside, but just right beside the college wall, and around 20 meters away from probably the college gate. He wanted to go use the restroom, and asked me to come inside with him, but I was like, Nah, I'm too tired. You go, and I'll just wait here. So he went leaving his phone with me. I was using my phone, sitting inside, on full brightness setting. Suddenly, 
a bike beeline towards the car. The two men sitting on it had those ski masks on and started tapping on the car window on the driver's side with a gun. Important to note that the passenger side where I was sitting was right beside a gutter so they couldn't come too close to me. They backed off and again came forward tapping the window, looking at me through the windshield and motioning me to roll down the window. I was too stunned to do anything. And they drove away when they saw other people approaching. All I wanted to do was save my boyfriend's phone, which was under my thigh, so it was a mission accomplished. I was on a vacation with my family when I was about 14. I was in the pool, which had a bar attached to it, and I was casually talking to this group of British people. I want to say that it was all guys, but I think I remember a girl with them. I started drinking a bit with them. The legal drinking age was 18, but the people who I was drinking with gave me an extra wristband that they had because apparently, they were leaving the resort that day and wanted to give it to someone. My parents didn't know about this, and neither of them knew that I was drinking. They were clearly a lot older, and they kept putting drink after drink in my hand. But I was ecstatic because I was, well, getting drunk in a pool in Cancun and out of sight from my mother. They started to try to convince me that one of the guys in the group was 15 and that I should try talking to him because he really liked me. Even then, I knew he definitely wasn't 15, but he also wasn't as old as the others who seemed to be in their late 30s. In hindsight, I'm thinking mid to late 20s or something like that. I was young and I just thought that they were joking around with me. They kept telling me he liked me and that I should go hang out with him. I laughed it off the first time, but they kept suggesting it. Keep in mind this whole time, my dad was in the same pool talking to his friend and he had his eyes on me for almost the whole time. My parents are very strict. He didn't know what I was drinking was alcohol and the pool was big enough that you couldn't hear what was being said. At that point, I was totally wasted, and my first time actually getting seriously drunk. I don't even remember leaving the pool with this guy, trying to tell me that he was 15, but apparently, my dumbass did, because I remember thinking that he was cute. The resort is huge, and I don't know how I don't remember walking through the whole thing and not remembering it. I wonder what we spoke about, but the next thing that I remember was walking and approaching a bus stop that was at least a 10-minute walk from the resort. I know that it was 10 minutes because my family and I often went to the bus stop to explore Cancun. He then told me that I had a nice body and asked me if I ever had sex. I just started laughing, and he sat on the bus bench and then pulled me onto his lap. At this point, my world is spinning, so I don't even protest, even though I remember thinking that I wanted to be back at the pool. It was then that something beautiful happened. I felt sick, and then I threw up all over him. Remember, I'm on his lap at this point, so it was like right in his face and on his chest, and I just kept throwing up, like the exorcist-level projectile vomiting. He was extremely grossed out. I don't remember what was said, but we ended up walking back to the resort, and I never saw him again. I remember feeling so embarrassed, which is ridiculous in hindsight, I then wobbled back to the pool area, covered in puke, where my mom had called the police and her and my dad were freaking out. My mom's piercing voice sobered me up a bit because I remembered these parts a lot clearer, 
even though they're still a bit hazy. They saw how drunk I was and demanded to know what had happened, so I told them. They then got furious, and my mom was adamant on finding that guy or his friends who had all disappeared from the pool. I didn't really see what the big deal was back then and why she wanted to find them. And to this day, I think about what would have happened if I hadn't thrown up like that and I actually left to them. I was 5 foot 2 and 14 years old and he was at least a foot taller than me, definitely not a minor. I remember when he was close to me with no one around and even in my extremely drunk state, I started to get a bit nervous. My parents took me back to our hotel room and I spent hours in the bathtub just throwing up. My mom was furious, like completely livid. I wasn't too surprised at that because she would yell over at me over trivial things all the time. But so was my dad, which surprised me because he was always so easygoing and honestly, probably would have been a bit amused at me being drunk and then throwing up, not in a cruel way, but because I was learning a lesson about alcohol that we all eventually do. He actually straight up told me that at some point before this whole vacation. But now I know that his anger wasn't directed towards me. He was cursing about that guy. I was still throwing up in the bathtub, and they had both went into the kitchen area to talk away from me. But I could vaguely hear my dad cursing terribly while speaking to my mom in our native language. And I actually felt scared. I couldn't focus on his voice because I was drifting in and out of consciousness at that point. But I remember getting less scared and more just sad because I felt like I had disappointed him. He never got mad like that towards me. But then again, I realized later that he wasn't angry at me. And he wasn't angry at the drinking. He was angry at that scumbag. I remember wondering why they were making such a big deal. And it was a few years later that I understood. Later on that day, I expected my mom to blow up at me over dinner when I was sober, as she usually does, that woman's like live views, but they were both kind of just quiet and staring at me and never left my side. I can't imagine what they were going through, knowing about the danger that I had been in hours before, staring at me like it was a miracle that I was there. I was young and stupid, but I would like to give my deep thanks and gratitude to beer for consistently annoying my stomach to the point of projectile vomiting. This happened last week, and while she didn't seem malicious, the thing she said was creepy. I'm a 19-year-old male, and I was going home from university, and for me to get home, I have to use the train. As I got on, a lot of the seats were already occupied. In my country, the seats are put in a way so that four people can talk and sit in front of each other, and they're kind of close, perfect for talking, even with strangers, sadly. I see that there is a free space in front of this girl who looks one or two years younger than me, but you can never know. I go there and I ask her if I can sit down. Of course, she replied, and then she looked at me in a strange, intense way. I pulled out my phone to distract myself from her, and she also had chocolate in her hand, and that's going to be important for later. She asked me, Where do you live? And I was like, Why do you have to know? So she asked me when I'm going to get off the train. I told her the place, and she told me that she's getting off the next one. But suddenly, she started singing, and then she said, Oh, sometimes I sing. I'm a silly girl. And then she did it 
again. Whenever she said something, she would look at me like she was waiting for a response. So I just replied, Oh, um, yeah, it's okay to be silly. Because I just didn't want to talk to her. And then she told me that, Hmm, you're pretty. And when I ask, What? She asked if she was pretty. And in my language, the second one is an extension of the first. So it seemed like she corrected herself. And then she asked if she had chocolate on her face, to which she did. And then she also offered me the chocolate, but I declined. She then told me about her piercing that came off, and she put it on the middle of the train. I told her that she could get it fixed where she got it. And she said, In Germany? Will you go there with me? But obviously, I told her no. While she tried to put on her piercing back in, she had a mouth piercing. She then told me that she was in love with me. I told her that I had a girlfriend. I really don't, but the university that I attend to has much prettier girls than her, and that the pacing is just too fast for me. And then she told me that she will beat up my girlfriend. Her I love you's then started escalating into I'll kidnap you. And then she said, Strip for me. She asked me if I'll go with her and if she could go home with me. Then, when the train arrived at my destination, she asked me, Are you going, love? I told her yes, and then I went on my way. Luckily, she didn't follow me home. She also asked me when we are going to meet again, but hopefully, never. Back in 2016, my family decided to have a family reunion and celebration of my great-grandmother's 100th birthday. I have quite a large extended family with many aunts, uncles, cousins, and great cousins, so we agreed to have it at a park and then do a cookout. Everyone would bring something from sides, drinks, snacks, and desserts, or they would pitch in for the cost of the meat that we would be cooking there. I was pretty excited myself, as I hadn't seen most of them in several years, and I used to be really close to some of my cousins, so I was ready to see them and finally catch up. The time came for the party, so my parents, myself, and my little sister, with our baked potato salad, made our way to the park. There were already several people there by the time that we arrived. Of course, it was a public park, so there were other kids and families on the playground, which was next to the shelter that we had rented. As more and more people showed up, I had to go around and say hi and tell everyone how I was doing and introduce myself to others. Some of the adults started cooking the hamburgers and hot dogs, while the rest of us all sat around talking. When some of my favorite cousins showed up, I quickly ran to hang out with them. I was 15, close to 16 at that time, so we decided to go hang out at the playground since my little sister and younger cousins were over there. On the playground, there was a swing set for four kids, and one of them was a little toddler-like seat. There was a rock wall that led to the top of the jungle gym where you could walk across this little bridge to a slide and something else. And on the other side by the rock wall was the monkey bars leading into a sandpit. There were some other little nearby things for the younger kids to play with, but this was the main area that we stayed in. Upon walking over there, my mom and sister were in the sandpit playing with the buckets that were in there to make a castle. After my mom and cousin talked for a few, she asked me to watch my sister so she could go back over to where my dad was. 
I agreed since me and my cousin Tasha wanted to walk away from the adults anyway. So we stayed with my sister. We helped her build the sand castle and we even partially covered her in sand up to her waist per her request. She really liked doing that and then she would try to climb out of it. Yeah, she was weird like that. But after a few times, we decided to go sit on the bench, which was opposite the sandbox. That way I could still see her, and we could talk a little more privately. We told each other just about everything, and not being able to see each other meant that we had a lot to share. Her mom, which was my aunt, ended up moving out of state and they didn't have a phone that we could talk freely on, so we just sent messages through Facebook occasionally. While sitting there talking, we also observed some of the people that were at the park that were not part of our family. Like there was a little boy sliding down, head first, licking the slide on his way. I can't make this up. All the while, his mother was arguing with someone on the phone, standing next to the slide. We saw a few other kids that were running around together, and two that started playing with my sister in the sand. Then we started seeing the strange ones. There was an older bald guy that showed up, but he stopped and talked to some of my family, so I just assumed that he was with us and just another person that I didn't know yet. After a while, he walked over to the park and sat on the bench on the opposite side on his phone. It struck us odd for a moment to have this guy sitting at the park when he didn't appear to have any kids over here. Why would you not be talking with the adults? I asked Tasha if she knew the guy, and she didn't, but she had the same thought as me. So, we just continued what we were doing, all the while, people watching, including the sky. But after a few, he noticed us looking at him, and then he smiled and waved. Not knowing how to react, we just did the same. Apparently, that was his cue to walk over to us. He said something to the effect of, A family reunion, huh? We just smiled and confirmed. Then he asked, So, who do you girls belong to? Again, based on his questions, we thought he was part of the family, so we told him our parents' names. He then claimed to be my father's and her mother's third cousin and explained that he hasn't been around in a while. We let it go and briefly talked about how old we were, what grade we were in, and the normal things that I had already been asked by others. He then said that he was going to walk around a bit and then waved goodbye. I noticed that he walked over to the sand pit and then started talking to the kids over there. He then pulled out his phone and took a picture of the three kids. Maybe as memories, but he didn't even mention taking a picture of us. We continued talking and watching the kids, all the while keeping an eye on this guy. He then got up from the sandpit and walked away to talk on his phone. I remember he looked annoyed with a call and eventually got off and walked over to the other kids on the playground and then started talking to them and actually helping one little girl go across the monkey bars. Now... I know it's probably normal for adults to help little kids around them. After all, I do that too when I'm at the park playing with my sister and a little kid asks for help. It was just a little odd to me that these kids he was picking up weren't part of our family gathering. Something didn't feel right. Something about this situation and this guy didn't sit right with me. And I told Tasha about it and she agreed. I could tell that she felt the same too, based on us both losing direction of our conversations. So as I was telling her that I was going to ask my dad about it, my sister had come running over saying that she was thirsty. I thought that it was perfect timing to walk over there. And as we got up from the bench, the guy swiftly walked over to us and said, 
I brought some drinks for the party. Could you girls help me bring them over to the shelter? I forgot to mention, the parking lot is quite long as there's also a walking slash bike path. So it expands the whole backside of the two shelters that were there and the playground. There's also an entrance to the park on each side of the parking lot. And while most of the family parked closer to the shelter, some had to park further down as it started filling. But this guy parked as far over to the opposite side as he could. He pointed over to where his hatchback was and said that he forgot to bring the cooler, so he just had a bunch of 12 packs that he needed help with. Hell no. This is exactly what I was afraid of. Tasha kind of froze, not knowing how to respond to the guy when I quickly told him that my sister wanted a drink, so I'm gonna drop her off with my mom first. He tried stopping us, saying that she could help carry something else that he had brought, to which I don't remember what it was. So instead, I said that we weren't allowed to leave the playground, so I would drop off my sister and let them know that I was going to be helping. This guy looked pissed. How could someone get so angry at a child just doing as their parents told them to? With his face turning red, I picked up my sister and I pushed Tasha ahead of me and we walked back to our parents. When I got there, I quickly asked my dad who was talking to someone else if they knew the bald guy. He looked confused at first and I told him that he claimed to be his cousin and explained everything that just took place. My mom looked worried, and right as she was talking about calling the cops, my dad joked that he'd just take care of that guy himself. That's when we started hearing a woman screaming from the park. A lot of us looked over to see what was going on when that woman started shouting, He has my kid! Several adults in my family started running over there to see what was going on and to round up the kids still on the playground. We were told to stay at the shelter while they figured things out. Shortly after, the cops showed up and several of us had to give statements, including me and Tasha, because as you've guessed it, it was the bald guy. Apparently, when we started walking back, he ended up snatching the girl that he was helping on the monkey bars, but he let go of her as someone caught up to him and tackled him. He barely got out of the parking lot when another cop was able to stop him. I heard all of this from my father as he was talking to other people about it. I was incredibly thankful that Tasha and I stuck to our gut and refused to go with this guy. We have no idea what his plans were after he got one of us, but it's a terrifying thought that I try not to think about. Today, I had my own creepy encounter. A few hours ago, I was outside on my 10-minute break in the town that I live and work in. I do this daily, as I need a second away from the office if you understand. I was on my phone, and I was just watching some TikToks, when I hear a bike stop in front of me. I look up, and it's a man on a bike. He has a winter coat on, but it's like 70 degrees out here. He has a bag full of loose Diet Cokes, and he looked very disheveled. He said hello to me. And me being too nice, I said hi back. He asked me how I was, and I just gave a very vague answer as I didn't want to ignore him in fear that he would do something crazy. He then asked me my name, which, first mistake, I told him. He introduced himself as James and asked me where I worked. I lied, and I said that it was the breakfast spot around the corner and he said if he could come by and talk to me sometimes. I told him no as I was going on a long vacation or leave, which was a big lie. He asked if I wanted a Diet Coke and that he could get one out for me if I want, 
I declined, and I said that I cannot have Pop just to get him off my back. He then asked me, Do I look old to you? I lied and I said, No. He then told me that I looked in the middle age bracket, but not too high up there. I'm legit in my mid-twenties, so I don't know what he was talking about, but I said thanks. He asked where I lived and if I lived in this town. I told him no, that I lived around 30 minutes away, which isn't true, but it was another thing to get him off my hair. He then reads my shirt, which out of all days, I am wearing a shirt that says my company that I actually work for on it, and he reads it out loud. I lie and I say that I used to work here, which is why I'm wearing the shirt. And I then called my co-worker to rescue me, and then he biked away. I don't know what his deal is, but I really hope that I do not see him when I leave today, as out of any day, I chose to bike to work. It happened to be today. Any thoughts on what the heck happened here? Update. He must stay around the library near my house because I saw him today, but luckily I was in my car, but he was relatively close to where I live. If I see him again, I'll make sure to ignore him. This actually happened to me a few months ago when I went to a small cookout. It was going to be me, my girlfriend Angie, my sister and her husband. We would be at my parents' house and possibly a few of their friends or neighbors. My parents don't live in the best neighborhood, but they make do with what they have. They do have one of the nicer houses on the block though, surrounded by some pretty trusty neighbors that are a bit younger than them, so I at least felt comfortable knowing that they were safe where they were. Angie was kind enough to make potato salad to bring because I fail at cooking almost anything and I brought soda. Once we got there, I was greeted by my mom in the kitchen, finishing up her cake that she always made. It's like a vanilla bean cake with strawberry and blueberry puree mixed in it. It's one of the best cakes that I have ever had. She also made grilled corn on the cob and baked potatoes, while my dad made the brats, hamburgers, and chicken, since my sister didn't eat red meats. Just laying out our spread for dinner, as it will be relevant for later. Shortly after us, my sister showed up with a little snack foods like crackers, cheese, chips, and dip. We were all sitting around talking when I realized that I hadn't brought out the soda. They had been sitting in the kitchen behind some other items. As I went to grab them, my dad mentioned putting them in a cooler, that way we could get them cold. As I went to get the cooler and pull some ice out of the deep freeze, I noticed that they didn't have any. My parents loved ice for some reason and they always had like a huge bag of it, so it was weird to see it empty. When I went up to ask them about it, they said their deep freeze had actually quit working, so they had to move what they could to their freezer and tried to save the rest in their little cooler, which included their ice. They had just got it fixed the day before and apparently forgot to go get more. I offered to go get some more, so my girlfriend and I went for ice. We went to the store that was maybe three miles or so away. It was one of the nicer ones in the area, with usually a lot of people around. That also meant there were more sitting outside of the front, asking for money, cigarettes, gas, and etc. Nothing really new to me. However, as we approached the store, there was a woman sitting nearby with a sign that just said, Stay safe. She was wearing a mask and sunglasses. She had her hair in a messy bun and was dressed like she just came from church. At first glance, you'd think it was someone doing the normal, but she wasn't asking for anything. She was singing. I couldn't tell you the song, but it sounded gospel-like. 
and as people walked by, she waved at them or nodded. A bit different to say the least, but not the strangest thing that I've ever seen. As we approached the entrance though, I noticed that she stopped singing and pulled her sunglasses up and just stared at us. From the moment that we got to the sidewalk and walked in, she stared, like she recognized us, but maybe couldn't remember who we were. And once it finally registered that she was staring at me, I just smiled and tried my best to not make eye contact. But you know that feeling when there's someone on the back of your head? I know she was watching me still. I made a hard dash around the corner once in the store and then turned to Angie to ask if she had witnessed that. And then turned to Angie to ask if she had witnessed that too, and she laughed. She obviously saw it too, but just joked that she was probably trying to intimidate me, maybe because she had never seen me before. I remember half-ass agreeing with her because why else was she doing that and why me? And from there, we just grabbed the ice, paid, and then headed back out. The entrance and the exit doors are one, so this means that I had to walk past the crazy lady again. So out we go, and not really thinking that I need to be on guard though, just that, that I would be stared at. But then, my arm is suddenly grabbed by none other than this lady. I look over real quick to her, and once again, see her lift her glasses and pull down her mask and all she says is, Don't eat the peppers. She has the most serious and concerned look on her face, and I stayed like that for a few seconds. Believe me, it felt a hell of a lot longer, but then she let go of my arm, slowly pulled her mask back up, and started singing again. I walked a little faster to my car while I kept looking back at her. And once again, in the car, I asked if Angie saw that. She again agreed that it was weird, but chalked it up to her just being crazy. I thought I was overreacting, but for some reason, the way she looked at me just freaked me out. Like she saw something in me, and it was weird. Back at my parents' house... We filled up the cooler, and Angie teased about the lady at the store. To my surprise, though, my parents were not surprised by this. She said she's always up there, and if she's not singing, she'd stop random people at the doors and say something weird to them, but said that they had never been stopped before. They also agreed, though, to not worry about it, as it was probably more the norm of what they see. And from then... We had a great night. A few of the neighbors came over and then left after drinking too much. And all of the food was great and the soda was cold. After people started leaving, me and Angie were the last ones there, as we typically are. And as we were talking, we got on the subject of produce since my girlfriend was attempting a small vegetable garden on our apartment balcony. My mom remembers that she had bought some banana peppers from a local farmer's market, and she thought that they would be sweeter, but they were too spicy. They both hate spicy food, so they offered to give them to us, saying that we could also use the seeds to plant. We didn't hesitate. I don't have a problem with spicy foods, but I also don't specifically seek them out either. We then gathered our take-home stuff and headed out. Once we were home and putting stuff away, Angie wanted to try the peppers, so she pulled one out and took a bite of it. She said it was actually sweeter than usual and offered it to me so I took a bite as well. It tasted as expected, again, not being huge on spice, so I just agreed with her. It was only about 9 when we left, and we were both off the next day so we stayed up to watch a movie. But not too far into the movie, I started getting a really bad dry mouth and found myself constantly clearing my throat. I felt bad because I got up several times to get more water and had this coughing fit, but she seemed more concerned about me as it just started happening out of nowhere. 
that's when it started getting harder to breathe. You can guess where this was going. I was having an allergic reaction, and the only thing that I ate recently were those damn peppers. Angie got me to the hospital quickly, and they gave me a really strong allergy med basically, and waited to make sure that the swelling in my face went down. It didn't dawn on us until after I got back home that the lady specifically told me not to eat the peppers. How would she have known any of that? My parents weren't with me, my mom didn't buy them from there, and they weren't even part of dinner. I've also never had any issue with peppers before. I know it's stupid, but I've even tested this since by trying a few other peppers, like jalapenos, and I've got no reaction. I'm afraid to try banana peppers again to see if it's now a permanent thing or if it's just that one off time. Another thing is, I am confused about this. I don't know if I'm scared of that woman or impressed. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.